My job for the next 15 minutes is to be your tour guide through the history of motion pictures, focusing on the history of the audience, the experience of exhibition, and how film has connected with other art forms. As I do so, the major message I want to get across here is the idea that the news of the death of cinema has been greatly exaggerated, right? That there are no dead media. There are dead delivery technologies, there are dead businesses, there are, de there are dead practices, but once we introduce a medium, a mode of human expression, extension of the human sensorium into the universe, they tend to persist. So dramatic theater, live theater persist in the face of cinema. Radio persists in the face of television. And so as we think about what's happening in the future, we have to understand that. What we see here is the cinema as it's been experienced by my son's generation, right? He's now in his 30s, and this is what cinema has been for him. But if we reify that and make it one thing, a very fragile thing, then we, we, then we don't know what to do with the passing of that set of institutions. So what I want to suggest tonight is that cinema has always been many things. There have been many spaces where films have been rejected, many experiences of going to the movies, many ways the audience has participated in the experience of movies, and many different connections between film and other media platforms. So as we think about the future, we need multiple histories because we will have multiple futures. So if we go back to the very beginnings of the cinema, what historians call the cinema of attractions takes place across a variety of different venues. So if you're middle class living in Los Angeles at the turn of the century, you might well have seen cinema for the first time in a vaudeville house alongside trained dog acts, baggy pants comedians, opera singers, acrobats, and people who danced on giant xylophones. And in that context, cinema was experienced as a series of short spectacular moments, not yet stories, not yet long form, scarcely short form. If you lived in the country, you might have experienced cinema through a traveling tent show. And the exhibitor there would also have been a master showman, would have projected the images, would have been the narrator, the star person personality, would have curated the show, would have edited the footage together, would have constructed the stories you were consuming seeing out of shots that were sold to him by various film producers. You might have seen a movie for the first time in an amusement park. There were rides, which consisted of railroad cars or gondolas or balloons that rocked back and forth, and images were projected to give you that sense of motion. And there might be steam pouring into your face as you watch those motion, those motion pictures. So there was an immersive experience of what movies might have looked at. The first movie theaters were, were simply shop fronts, adopted quickly, peanut shells on the floor where people might go to to see a series of short subjects. The audience here is mostly, far, mostly immigrant populations, mostly lower class populations, and it would not be at all unusual for the one, one person who spoke English to be articulating to the crowd in a variety of languages what they were watching spontaneously from the audience. So the audience from the very beginning is part of the show. Films only begin to become features when we have ready-made theaters, when theaters have their own facilities where we can be comfortably seated in that magic chair and experience the film for a more prolonged period of time. And by the late 1920s, film becomes part of something bigger. If you've been to the movie, been to my home street Broadway, you can see something like a dozen surviving movie palaces that are still there. Those movie palaces would not only have shown two feature films, uh, live entertainment, uh, sing-alongs, but would also have maybe included a nightclub, a bowling alley, a daycare center, a restaurant, a barber shop or beauty salon. You went there for the day, and movies were part of that overall experience. And if we continue thinking about what movies could have been, the drive-in would have been another model by the 1950s as we began to move out to the suburbs, the open spaces, the car culture of LA would have invited us to go see movies outside in the privacy of our own cars. Today, we're still exploring what other spaces can be used for movies, <laughs> right? So this is a dive-in movie, not a drive-in movie. 
right? We can think about secret cinemas creating re uh, unique cinematic experiences where movies are seen in just the right space for that movie, and you have to be in the know to get there. And as we heard earlier, we are seeing movies projected on all kinds of physical surfaces in the world around us. Both authorized and unauthorized screenings of movies create unique experiences, events, that, that people go to see at the movies. An event might be something like the screening of Star Wars at the Hollywood Dome or the LA Symphonic Orchestra play, playing live accompaniment. These are the kinds of futures, future events that will, will keep people coming back to the cinema as a unique experience again and again and again. The event brings with it a sense of immersiveness. So we can do the history of the 50s and the competition of television through a series of technologies. Here we have Cinerama, but all of those technologies promise us more or less the same things today's technologies promise to immerse us into a cinematic experience. So Cinerama puts you into the th picture brings you a whole new world. Here we have aroma-rama. See it, hear it, smell it. And I think who smelled it, dealt it. I'm not sure. Uh, or a little later, surround sound. An event in 70 millimeters and surround, since surround, see it, hear it, feel it. We've seen 3D come, go, come again. But 3D is just the beginning because around the world we're now seeing 4D, 5D, 6D, 7D. You got numbers, we'll keep putting Ds after it. And what they're all promising are new kinds of immersive experiences of what a movie might be. And whoa, dude, that's just the beginning, right? As we move into the world of virtual reality, the immersive experience of cinema can begin yet again something new and yet something that goes all the way back to the Hales tours at the amusement parks, the turn of the century. And we take for granted that we can, for a long time we've taken for granted, we can see movies in other spaces, on airplanes, in classrooms. The 30s and 40s, they were already there in schools, in prisons, on military bases. Movies always went beyond the commercial movie theater. And even before we had motion pictures, we had home-based technologies where amateurs could project stories, in this case, The Magic Lantern, in the late 19th century. We could talk about Super 8 movies. We can talk about Viewmasters. We can talk about film strips. All technologies which allowed the audience to sample their favorite moments from their favorite movies and to bring that into the context of their home. And all of that looks toward the world of VHS, the world of DVD, and now the world of streaming video on our phones and other appliances. Now, every time I go to the movies these days, I see them telling me, you don't want to watch a movie on a screen that size. But that's not the only context where we're watching movies in the context of our home. And we now have uh, movie the home movie theaters in some cases that are as sophisticated as those multiplex screens were 30 years ago. And we're, those are only going to get better. So as we think about cinema, the future of cinema will involve diverse, not singular exhibition experiences, both public and private, both in commercial movie theaters and beyond. We will have event movies that we all turn out to see, and we'll have movies that we, we will watch when we have time, and we'll watch by whatever device we have handy at the time that movie is available. We may have fewer event movies in the future, but the rest aside that 100 years plus of history of public exhibition of feature films tells us we will always have movie events. Second history, history of, star of fandom, right? So from the very beginning of the silent era, stars coexisted with their fans, whether through fan letters, autograph lines, fan clubs, where people collected and agreed to see it. This is a connected audience too, right? These people felt connected to the star and connected to each other through the social networks they forged as fans in relation to movies. And the idea of participatory culture, we can take back to something like the original Mickey Mouse Clubs that Disney organized in movie theaters in the 20s and 30s, which had Saturday morning matinees, craft shows, all kinds of experiences which encourage people to come back every week as a participant in the experience of being of, of a Disney movie. So the second Mickey Mouse Club was the one that was produced on television in the 1950s, but the first one's worth remembering. The movie theater and the movie that where that magic chair was, the movie palace of the 20s and 30s, 
also would have been a space where people sang along, right? Follow the bouncing ball. So we were encouraged to be part of the show. There might be amateur night performances. We were not simply there to be spectators. We were there to be participants. And the idea of performing the movie really reached its high point in high day in the 70s and 80s with midnight movies like Rocky Horror Picture Show where people were encouraged to come in costume, dance in the aisle, throw things at the screen. And this is a global phenomenon. So if we go to India, say, we would see Bollywood dance as a central part of the experience of what film means in India. If we go to Japan, we see cosplay in Yoyogi Park in Tokyo is one of the ways in which people dressed up like their favorite characters from anime films or manga and really became part of the phenomenon they were invested in. And here in California, we certainly know about the cosplay that takes place in San Diego every summer where I get together with 150,000 of my closest friend friends and Hollywood comes and puts on a show for us because we've all got Twitter, we've all got blogs, we've all got Facebook, and we are part of the publicity machine that Hollywood counts on now to get the word out about exciting fall and summer releases. But I, from the very beginning, we were not simply viewers of movies. So here are the Lumiere brothers. Most of you who know the history of movies know that they are kind of the key, an early moment in the history of cinema in almost every country around the world. Why do we have so many movies of people leaving factories and getting off trains? Because the Lumieres would come set up their, their camera in a public place, film people, and then pass out a flyer saying, come to the theater tonight, you can see your picture on the big screen. So as long as we've had movies, we've had amateurs participating in movies. And when they came time to build an army of camera crews to travel the world, they went to amateur camera clubs across Europe, people who were already experimenting with the technology, and they became the first wave of filmmakers. So the move from amateur to professional was there from the very beginning. By the late silent period, we have fan films that are being produced, and we know, well documented, there were lots of films made around the hour gang comedies because you amateur filmmaker dad could take his camera in the backyard, gather the kids in the neighborhood, and they could make an hour gang movie. This is a cover of a magazine, 1937, Movie Maker, the magazine of the Amateur Cinema League. So by 1937, there are enough amateur filmmakers in the U.S. to, to have, us pub, have organizations, to have magazines. By the time I entered the picture in the 1960s, I'm part of this generation of movie mo monster fans. And the movie brats, the Spielbergs, the Lucases, the Zemeckises, the Landises, the people whose names are in the buildings at USC, they grew up reading famous monsters of Filmland magazine. And, and there, Forrest K. Ackerman was encouraging us to try monster makeup, you know, what it is to be a guy in the 60s and be playing with your mom's makeup to see if you can look like Dracula, right? Super 8 movie cameras, models, every possible way that we could express ourselves through the language of monster movies, which were this kind of, and out of that came a generation of the, the, the big blockbusters that have made Hollywood what it is today. What's different, perhaps, was that those were called home movies, right? They were called home movies because they were shot at home, they were watched at home, and if we were lucky, we got a neighbor in to pay 15 cents to buy a bag of popcorn to watch our movies. Right? Today, home movies have become public movies. In the age of YouTube, high school kids are producing the same kinds of movies, putting them out on the web, and they become, and the right moment, one of them can get 100,000 views, right? can reach critical mass, can, go, quote, go viral, or as I prefer, go spreadable. Right? So that moment, today the people who are making those movies are the future USC students. They are the future Lucas's, Spielberg's, and, and so forth. But that's only one of the ways the audience is choosing to participate. So fan fiction, hundreds of thousands of stories set around every possible fictional universe. Were you disappointed by a TV show, series, book, or film? If you still love your fandom, discover fan fiction today and have the story your way. And increasingly, the audience is encouraged to be an investor, to support films that they, that they care about and get films made that might not have been made under the studio system Otherwise, and I think we're going to see more and more examples of crowdfunding, filmmakers courting the audience from the very conception of their film. So again, the future film audience will demand the right to meaningfully participate in the cinema experience. I tell my students at USC, we live under the sign of Felix. Right? So if you've been to USC campus, you've seen this Felix the Cat sign on a car dealership. Felix was one of the first transmedia personalities. 
He was in sheet music, he was in Broadway shows, he was in the comic strip, he was on the animated on the big screen, and he was in all kinds of brand products across the culture. This simply is one of those examples of brand extension that survived throughout the 20th century and is still with us today. Chaplin was in comic strips. Many of the stars I grew up in in the 50s and 60s had their own comic books, whether it's Jerry Lewis or Three Stooges. That was just the beginning of the print culture that surrounds the film of the day. Film was never simply the movie. Film was always part of a collage of media experiences. So the star system depended on movie magazines, depended on collectibles. These are cigarette cards that predate bubblegum cards uh, that were the collectibles of the star system of the, early, the 20s and 30s. And stars would leave Hollywood, go to various towns and cities across America, and Roy Rogers, Dale Evans, and Trigger would suddenly step off the big screen and be right there in your shopping center. I remember seeing one of the munchkins from Wizard of Oz when I was a kid, and it's an experience I carried with me forever after. Beyond that, radio had a number of series which performed films, even some films still in the theater, sometimes with the original cast, sometimes with other cast members. And part of the pleasure of listening to the Lux Radio Theater is seeing classic parts and classic films played by different Hollywood stars. Little Big Books takes the story we saw on the screen and extended it in new directions. And of course, locate Disney takes that the next step to location-based experiences so we can ride the movies that we, are invest that we become invested in. And Disney gave us the tools, the costumes, the props, so we can perform those movies that were part of our fantasy life as kids. Lucas takes it gives us the avatars, the action figures. Uh, and Star Wars, you know, if we think about some of the characters like Boba Fett and Star Wars, they were built not on the big screen, but in people's backyards. As people played Boba Fett, invested the character, and he became a cash cow for the Lucasfilm empire. And we're even talking about making a full-on Boba Fett movie in this next wave of Star Wars productions. So all of it is the same. Hollywood has always been not simply a movie, but a transmedia experience. And I wrote in my book, Convergence Culture, about The Matrix as not only three films, but also a series of animated shorts, a series of comic stories, a series of video games, all of which are interconnected, and information travels freely across them. Each makes their unique contribution to the experience as a whole. And that's, today, transmedia has become a buzzword in the industry, and we're seeing it everywhere from park benches. These are the park benches created around District 9 when the film came out, and we saw lots of those here in Los Angeles, to the web. And Bent Bullet is a conspiracy theory site about how the X-Men killed JFK. And that's the TED Talk from Prometheus. Both examples of very compelling digital content that spread, created awareness of those films, and were part of the overall experience. So if we want to think about the future of cinema, it will be a transmedia phenomenon, as it has been in the past, with storytelling extending across every available media platform. So if I'm asked, what's the future of film going? It's going to be, film is going to be experienced in multiple venues as an event and as an everyday activity. That film is going to be something we participate in, that we help create, as well as simply something we watch. And film will be transmedia, a driver of entertainment experiences we have across media platforms. So thank you. <laughs>